So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to present this work here because it's really uh, nice to to listen. Many things that I want to explain today in Spain is doesn't work. I mean, yet at least. So uh, my focus is just on on three different sections. It's like the first I will present the most significant data about drugs and sports consumption in Spain. Then I will show specific data about steroid consumption among Spanish adolescents. And finally, I will point out some notes about the Spanish anti-doping policy with a specific attention to the harm reduction policies conducted in Spain. And all data that I'm going to, to present uh, come from the latest results from different official surveys conducted by Spanish health institutions. So a general population survey on drug use among people aged 15 to 64 has been carried out in Spain on a biennial basis since 1995. The latest survey was carried out in 2013 uh, with a sample of more than 23,000 respondents. This survey found that cannabis was the most commonly used illicit substance in Spain with 30.4% of the respondents reporting lifetime use, followed by cocaine with 10.3%, ecstasy at 4.3%, and amphetamines at 3.8%. And there are some indications that uh, that the prevalence of recent use of most uh, illicit substances has declined slightly since, since 2009. However, since 2011, there is a slightly increased consumption of legal substances such as alcohol, tobacco, and hypnosedatives. Uh, the consumption of drugs, both legal and illegal, is more spread among men, except for uh, hypnosedatives, where the proportion of female users is twice that of males. Of Concerning steroids, first data come from the survey conducted in 2011 where it was included a novel section labeled as new substances, either because they have recently appeared on the market or because, although being known substances, its use has been taken or retaken by certain groups of the population. Among these substances, besides asteroids, we can find ketamine, nexus, methamphetamine, magic mushrooms, research chemicals, etc. In 2013, 0.2% of the Spanish population aged 15 to 64, reported steroids lifetime use, reducing 0.1 from data collected in 2011, when the percentage was 0.3% of the population, which entails a slightly decrease in the consumption of these substances. If we pay attention to this figure, we can see that this reduction was specifically significant in an age range between 55 to 34, descending from 0.6 in 2011 to 0.2% in 2013. As regards gender, the percentage of asterisk users among men is higher than among women. However, this figure shows that there is a reduction of male users descending from 0.5% in 2011 to 0.3% in 2013. Meanwhile, female consumers have remained stable at 0.1%. If we consider just young people, a national survey on drug use among students aged 14 to 18 has been conducted every second year in Spain since 1994 alternating with the both men's on survey that is conducted with general population. The most recent was conducted in 2014, and the results show that the most commonly used uh, illicit drug was cannabis with lifetime prevalence of 29.1%, which, contrary to the results of general population studies, indicates a reduction in experimental use as compared to previous studies since 2004. However, the complete report hasn't been published yet, and concerning asteroid use, we still have to refer to the results of previous survey conducted in 2012, in which participated more than 27,000 students from 750 high schools countrywide. This survey was the first to include specific questions related to asteroid use. So, unfortunately, for the, for the time being, it's not possible to show you any evolution of these results for the age range 14 to 18 years old. The results show that 0.7% have consumed asteroids at least once in their lives, 1.1% for male and 0.3% for female. And as we have seen, these percentages are higher than in general population. If we analyze these results in detail, we can see that the age of 17 is where we can find a higher percentage of users, 1%, with a peak in the amount of male students that reported asteroid use at 1.6%. From a gender perspective, the percentage of asteroid users among men is constantly higher than among women. For male students, the results range between 0.8% at the age of 15 and 18, 
Tooth already mentioned 1.6% at 17 years old. Concerning female students, the results range between 0.1% at the age of 16 to 0.5% at 15 years old. These figures are lower when we analyze the results focusing just on the reported due to in the last 12 months. Here we can see that 0.5% of the students affirmed have used esteroids in that period of time, 0.8% per male and 0.2% for female. However, the data distribution follows a similar pattern as compared to the previous figure, with the exception of female students at age of 18, where this percentage is nearly zero. Furthermore, if we just focus on the last 30 days of report esteroids use, these numbers decrease to 0.3% of the student's population. This survey also offers uh, remarkable data. For instance, 42.1% of the students have never heard about esteroids, so they are unaware of health problems that can suppose to consume these substances. Nevertheless, among those who have heard about esteroids, 84.9% of the students who reported lifetime use are aware of the problems for their health if they could consume these substances on a regular basis. In addition, it's important to note that 37.8% of the steroids users manifest a reduced risk perception, affirming that to consume these substances sporadically doesn't suppose a significant risk for their health. Therefore, it seems that giving information to adolescents about the potential risk, health risks of these substances is far from discouraging them to avoid its consumption. Finally, more than a half of the students, 53.9%, consider that steroids are readily available. This percentage grow up, grows up to 72.7% of for the students that reported lifetime use, who affirm that can easily have access to esteroids in 24 hours. And for the last part of the presentation, let me share with you a few thoughts about how these figures should be taken into account by the anti-doping institutions in Spain. The Spanish Anti-Doping Agency, named as the Spanish Agency for Prote Protection of Health in Sport, EPSAP, has its main mission to implement the state's policies on health protection in sport and in particular the fight against doping and the scientific research into sport. As you can tell, there is an omission of the word doping in the name of the agency, being a very few worldwide that have such peculiarity. For instance, in Spain, the main focus is placed on health, but in other countries, the focus is placed on ethics. For example, the Canadian Anti-Doping Agency is called Canadian Center for Ethics in Sport. However, the Spanish Anti-Doping Agency mainly focuses its resources on athletes with a federative license. So those who practice physical activities without a license, for instance, gym practitioners, are not their main concern. This fact has been already pointed out in the study on doping prevention published in 2014 uh, by the European Commission, where among the researchers involved, we can find Professor Jane McVeigh that we have heard the opportunity in this morning. This study is right when it appears that in Spain, doping prevention in recreational sport is considered neutral because although anti-doping policies are applicable to all athletes, that is, elite, low-level competitive and fitness athletes, most rules apply only to practitioners with a federative license. Therefore, when rules and prevention programs are mainly focused on ethics or fair and fair play, it could be less effective with populations with a federative license where competition is in a second place. In addition, information campaigns about health risks, in this slide you can see an example of one of the guides distributed in Spain, doesn't seem to be enough to discourage esteroid users, as we have seen based on the results of the Spanish survey. It could be a harm reduction approach more effective. I think that this topic should be considered. Concerning harm reduction policies, Spanish health authorities explain in the official reports that the reduction of drug-related risk and harm is one of the principal objectives of the National Drug Strategy for 2009 to 2016 period. Particular focus is given to the activities that facilitate contacts with drug injectors, provide information and education, and promote behavior and practice change. Latest data from 2013 point out that needle and syringe programs distributed more than 2.7 million syringes. 12 facilities of supervised drug consumption were available in the regions of Catalonia and Basque Country. In 2012, these facilities serve almost 6,000 people. However, in the current national drug strategy, there is not a single word concerning sport practices. Therefore, although in the harm reduction policy, one of the target group are people who frequent the environment and participate in situations where there is an easy access for consumption, these situations are described in this document, and I quote, 
youth environments for entertainment such as parties or nightclubs, but no gyms or sport facilities are named. This is because although esteroids are dangerous substances whose effects can be compared to other drugs, they don't have the same social treatment. Maybe one of the first myths that should be banished is that because consumption is done in gyms, it's a healthy activity. Nevertheless, it's necessary to point out that harm reduction programs in public education <coughs> focusing just on heroin addicts in marginal situations and little by little they are achieving to broader and more integrated sectors of the society. I hope that this tendency continues and Spain, Spanish harm reduction programs start considering new populations as image and performance enhancing drug users. If this happens, it should combine the guidance and resources of both health and anti-doping policies. However, this scenario seems to be far away yet. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Any comments or questions for the room? Yes, ask. Thank you, Rodrigo. Very, very interesting. And um, one of the problems I, I've heard often debated, and Jeff, you can probably add in on this, is that when you ask teenagers questions on steroids, do you really know if they know what they are responding to? Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially when you have so, such low response uh, or, or, or confirming rates, about 0.7% as you have. Mm -hmm. um, there was a study once where they included a fantasy drug in a, in a questionnaire to seniors, so it was fantasy loan or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that there was also 1% who had tried fantasy loan, <laughs> as, so, which was the same percent as, as tried anabolic steroids. So when you, when you come out and say, well, how do you interpret those data that if they don't, how do we know if they know what anabolic steroids are? Yeah. What, what, is, what are your thoughts? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I'm from, uh, from my research experience, I like more like uh, interviews because it's the best way to do that. In this data, that is only official data that I've accessed because they started in 2011, they included this and it's like, I, I saw the survey, it's like there's a list with these uh, new substances that they call, like the reason I need, like ketamine, nexus, methamphetamine, and it's included steroids in this, in this. So if they check that, I mean, it's when we assume that they know about that, and because, but it's true that this is a British with this kind of, of service, but at the end, the, the point is that they only have access at, at this moment with this, and this is a good approach to, to have more focus on doing research in other ways to just Keep that as the as the reality of Spain. It's true. Yeah. Yes. Um, that that question and the response has provided a partial preview of my talk this afternoon. Um, it's, uh, we, I shall also be talking about uh, results on self-reported use of anabolic steroids by adolescents in the survey. And it's rather surprising that the organisers didn't put us in the same session. Uh, uh, I think exactly those uh, two points uh, came up in, to my mind when I saw your presentation. Um, one, does the questionnaire provide any explanation or examples of what anabolic steroids are? Mm -hmm. Mine doesn't. No. And the other is, are the anabolic steroids uh, asked about separately or simply within a list of other substances? The latter applies to Ryan. Yeah. yeah. And it also applies to you. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, it's based, I guess that, I don't know, it's like an European way to do that, because also you can check in the European statistics some this comparison of data. And Spanish started doing that in 2011 with general population, 2012 with students. And they include like new substances. So they have to check and to, and to and then they assume in the explanation of the, of the report that they, they know when they check that. Mm -hmm. I completely agree that this not really, it's not a, it's for, uh, an idea, but it's not the reality. Uh, we have to start with this, and I'm sure it's, it's necessary to, to do a, a deeper research in this topic, because you studied, I mean, for example, for this conference, I, I asked, uh, I have a, an interview with the responsible of the Spanish Antidoping Agency to explain the purpose of this conference, and it was like, really? <laughs> So, so it's something that is it's not yet in the idea to learn to to have like this kind of, of things that you have in in Spain or in Germany. So we have started. So I guess that we have many things to do yet. Um, 
just in the SPAT survey, which covers most European countries, but I don't think Spain participates in it. Um, steroids have not been as a new substance, they've been in at least since 1999. Mm -hmm. Any more comments or questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just feel like in the, in the information before this, in the lecture theatre, and in here a little bit, and I don't know what other, other people might disagree, but I feel like we're kind of missing um, something in that it's great doing harm minimization and education and information but it feels like just like any other drug use you know the reasons are so multifaceted it might be you know uh, trauma dysfunction all kind of mental health and it feels like especially with steroids our young people aren't happy with themselves and that could be for again so many different reasons and it almost feels like we're kind of jumping over that. And even in, in the previous lecture that I just heard, steroid use is different. Well, actually, we all think that they're very different, but the outcomes are often the same, which is death, obsessive behaviours. Um, and I kind of struggle with that because I understand all kinds of drug use is, is different, but the same, often. It's hard when you get... Young people already think they're very different if they go into a gym. Even when they're sharing needles, they still think they're very different than needle other other drug users. And for me, that kind of enables the use to carry on more because they, they keep thinking that they're different. That kind of denial side of it. So I just wanted to, to say that where I work, the young people that are using steroids and older people aren't actually doctors. The people from council states that are getting bad information, getting bloodborne viruses, and not even seeing that, seeing that they're in those risk categories. So I'm just quite aware of that sure. differentiating sure, sure. elitist. Sure. Stuff. I mean, I know for a fact that we are having, we are definitely having one of the main uh, presentations later on, discussing about the different. Uh, and yeah, yeah, exactly, in different ways of, uh, and, and, and I agree with you uh, in, in that, you know, it was mentioned uh, sometime this morning that uh, there seems to be a lot of, uh, you know, informed use of steroids, and maybe that's true for uh, a few people, for some people, but uh, perhaps there's a lot of uh, completely uninformed use, so plus the different motivations that you know, are, are behind it, the different uh, backgrounds, so that's quite interesting, yes. I, I, I also think it's, uh, it's, it's more space there to explore, definitely. I think that's yeah. the difficulty when we come fixate on a substance, yeah. rather than thinking about the individuals mm -hmm. and the group things and the cultural aspects of it, because sure. you come fixate on steroids and then it's like, oh, well, everybody who uses steroids must be informed because you must be taking this mm -hmm. set of decisions because you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Increase lean muscle and all of this, but actually, mm -hmm. that might be one group of individuals, and that might mimic the set of behaviours and the cultural background of individuals who use ecstasy safely, or individuals who use heroin relatively safely and do so for extended periods of their life. But actually, it doesn't replicate a lot of other people who have multiple mm -hmm. complex yeah. issues and the root causes for why they might actually be using yeah. substances and then develop problems. And you could probably parachute in almost any substance to that. Yeah. That's it, but I Sure, sure. I agree. Any, any more thoughts on this one? No? Okay, so in that case, we'll wrap it up now. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thank